Greetings, this we're in. Uh, welcome to the 2024 series of Animating Democracy. Also used with the, uh, gentlemen, have a seat. Uh, also, uh, the Ebonic and uh, folk uh term, live and learn. Well, live and learn. So our series, which is a hybrid series, and I welcome all of those of you in Pennsylvania, in the Mid-Atlantic Arts region, and in the United States and Ireland who join us for the series. This is February 14th, many, many days today, good friends. Of course, you know it is Valentine's Day. It's also Ash Wednesday. Yesterday was Mardi Gras. It is also the birthday of the very brilliant Lydia Hamilton Smith, the confidant of Thaddeus Stevens, uh, who literally pinned for him the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment as he dictated them because of his arthritis and his palsy in the old pen. So it is literally Lydia's uh, signature that is on the documents in Smithsonian that say Thaddeus Stevens' original drafts of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Lydia was born, good friends, on Valentine's Day, and she died on Valentine's Day. It's also the birthday of Frederick Douglass, which is why we're here to send him up spiritual and rhetorical and oratorical cupcakes, if you will, for his birthday. Frederick was beyond his years and as an, beyond his time. And as an example of what a Renaissance man he, he was, we thought we would start with Robert Campbell's short on Frederick Douglass, Renaissance Man. Sorry, I had the wrong video. <laughs> Just one moment. Oh, oh, wow, we're waiting. Those of you who are joining us virtually, you know, we started our virtual salon during COVID. Uh, before that, it was a, a live salon in the old facility upstairs. We are in the McCormick Riverfront Libraries, Thomas Morris Chester Research Center. It is the home of the Pennsylvania Path Players. And we're about to see Robert Campbell from Philadelphia's uh, interesting piece on the, the multiple images of Frederick. Right. Rap. They're thought of as being for vain young people, with their lips pursed, downward angle, smizing, and posting to the gram for likes. Well, some of that is true. But selfies are actually one of the most important cultural movements that we've ever had. They show the world how we see ourselves, and that helps change how they see us too. But to fully understand the selfie's power, you have to look at the first person who really harnessed it. 19th century abolitionist, Frederick Douglass. No, that's Don Cheadle playing Frederick Douglass. We're talking about this guy. Even though there are relatively few photos of black people from that time period, you've probably seen a photograph of him. There's a reason for that. He was the most photographed American of the 19th century. Photographed more than President Lincoln, more than General Custer, more than Ulysses S. Grant. Obviously, Douglass never used a smartphone's camera. He didn't even take the first self-portrait. But when it comes to choosing how you want to be presented, getting your face out into the public eye, and altogether changing people's perceptions of you, and maybe an entire group of people, there's only one person who invented the selfie as we know it. When I was around five years old is, is when I started to notice that my ancestors 
had some importance. Back home, three of the 13 new Frederick Douglass statues were unveiled today. I would ask my classmates and my friends, are your, your grandparents on statues? <laughs> your grandparents on money? No. My name is Kenneth B. Morris Jr. I'm the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass and great, great grandson of Booker T. Washington. Frederick Douglass was born into slavery in Maryland, but at the age of 20, he escaped and went on to become one of the nation's foremost abolitionists and statesmen. But to help end slavery, he knew that he had to challenge the insidious, racist perceptions of the people who were enslaved. Enter the selfie. You had all of this propaganda that was out there to characterize people that were enslaved, people of African descent, as being less than human. And so you would see these exaggerated features and big eyes and big lips, making them an other to justify mistreating them, dehumanizing them, taking away their freedom. And Frederick would put himself right in the middle of that. The aesthetics of his photographs, he was always dressed to the nines. He was a trendsetter. His hair was looking good, even in the style of his beard or his goatee. At the time, the backgrounds in photography were really ornate. And if you look at his images, you see that they're very simple. But he also understood that within that photograph, things had to be staged. And so in one image, you might see a table with books on it. He wanted the focus to be on him. And he said, I never want to look like a happy, amiable fugitive slave. And so he's looking directly into the camera with that steely glare, basically saying, try to deny that I'm a man worthy of freedom and worthy of citizenship. The other aspect of selfie culture that Douglas understood, social media. For that time period, this meant printing these photos and getting them seen by as many people as possible. He would give away pictures of himself. That person that receives the picture would now hang his image up on the wall next to their family members. And now he is seen as a friend, as a family member. Over the course of his public career, we've discovered 168 photographs of him. He understood that he could present himself as a man worthy of freedom, worthy of citizenship, and change how people thought about people of African descent who were enslaved. Today, five billion people in the world have cell phones, and three billion people are on some form of social media. People are taking so many photos that we've come to think of them as frivolous. But the increased accessibility to photography and distribution means more people can present themselves as they want to be seen. Trans men, trans women, those who are genderqueer or non-conforming, those with diverse neurology or diverse physiology. Teenagers, adults, seniors. Douglas is singular in his struggles and his accomplishments, but he laid out a blueprint for how we take selfies based on how we want others to see us. And here's just one example. Jana Garza is an artist in Austin, Texas, who was diagnosed in 2015 with polymyositis, a progressive muscle wasting disease. When she was worried about being perceived as sick, the selfie offered her a way out. I was on a lower dose of chemo than most people, like cancer patients, for example. But then my hair just started falling out in clumps. And one night I decided to shave it. I took a picture of myself that night. And I think that's the night that my self-portraits began. One of my early favorites is the boxer. Although I probably didn't realize it at the time, one of the driving elements of creation there was trying to express myself as someone who wasn't sick. For me, the whole selfie movement liberated me and gave me an avenue to express myself, gave me an avenue to put myself out there the way that I wanted to be represented. It's just my self-expression and it's my illness doesn't live there. And I think that art saves lives. I know it saved mine. In the last 17 years of his life, 
Frederick Douglass resided in this house. From the second floor, he could see across the Chesapeake Bay to where he had been born into slavery. It was a reminder of how far he had come and about how much can change in just one generation. The first iPhone only came out a little over a decade ago. And now a majority of the world's population has a smartphone with a great camera at all times. An entire generation has grown up with these tools. They're using selfies to continuously define and redefine their identity, their sense of self. So what would Frederick Douglass do with a smartphone? Certainly, if he were here today, he would be on Twitter with 10 million followers. He would be on Instagram taking selfies and instead of 168 images, he'd have 168,000 images probably in a month's time. And so people today can use that technology in the same way Frederick used technology in his day to communicate a message. Oh, hey there. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a like and subscribe to free. And he used this notion of the self <laughs> to capture, like haiku, the essence of every movement of his, of his thought arc. Why do I call it a thought arc? Frederick Douglass attempted to escape three times before he was su successful. We refer to it not as an escape, but as a self-emancipation. So it took him three times to self-emancipate. The first and the second time, he attempted a conventional route, the Underground Rail, the river, the rail, the cave. But he was caught both times. On the third time, Clark, he tried camouflage. His common law wife knew that stevedores on the docks had free movement and free passage from one loading dock to the next. And so she made Frederick Douglass a stevedore's costume. And he went down to the dock and got between all the other workers, started loading things on the boat and he escaped. He began his quest for freedom. He left Virginia and came into Pennsylvania in 1838 on the same year that Pennsylvania Hall, the abolitionist hall, was burned to the ground. On the same year that Robert Purvis and the free men of color lost their battle in the Capitol to save the Constitution of Pennsylvania, which allowed free men of color who owned land to vote until 1838. So as Frederick came to freedom, he discovered that the North was de deconstructing the very freedoms that he thought, Mark, he was moving forward to achieve. He arrives the year that Blacks lose their vote in Pennsylvania and it takes them to 1870. So it's, it's the the reappropriation of the vote in 1870 that Frederick and the men that were in his circle. So just like the movie that we saw, the short that we saw, which was all about selfies of Frederick, not about the decades and the arcs and the wrinkles, we are going to present you with some selfies of Frederick Douglass, some oral selfies, if you will. Now, Mr. Douglas spoke on an average of two hours to three hours for each speech. And across his life from 1841, when Thoreau and Emerson invited him to speak in the uh, Chautauquas and the Lyceums of their circles, until 1896, when he discovered what a great law Plessy versus Ferguson truly was. His speeches were like chronicles of the politics. We cannot present in full repertoire his speeches this evening. 
So I've asked these six gentlemen, gentlemen, would you take your places, please? If they will present for you oral <laughs> eloquence as selfies of the famous and famous speeches of Frederick Douglass, 1841 to 1896. We present this in the style of Reader's Theater, which is voice theater. And so Frank Healy Jr. has uh, uh, amassed an ensemble of really exceptional voices. And we now treat you to Frederick Douglass Awaken. Those of you who know me know I need a stage manager. <laughs> but Frank is after tonight. So, <laughs> don't. Frederick Douglass, awake. Slaves are generally accepted into to sing as, as well as to work. Frederick Douglass, 1838. Everybody has asked the question, what shall we do with the Negro? I have had but one answer from the beginning. Do, do nothing with, with us. us. <laughs> Your doing with us has already played enough mischief. Without a struggle, there can be no progress. Frederick Douglass, Nantucket, August 1841. I feel greatly embarrassed when I attempt to address an audience of white people. I'm not used to speak to them, and it makes me tremble when I do so because I've always looked up to them in fear. Still, my, the soul that is within me, no man can degrade. My friends, I have come to tell you something about slavery, what I know of it as I have felt it. When I came north, I was astonished to find that the abolitionists knew so much about it that they were acquainted with its deadly effects. And if they had lived in its midst, but though they can give you its history, though they can depict its horrors, they cannot speak as I can from experience. They cannot refer you to a back covered with scars as I can. For I have felt these wounds. I have suffered under the lash without the power of resisting. And yet, my master has the reputation of being a pious and a good Christian. He was the leader of a Methodist church. I have seen this pious leader cross and tie the hands of one of his young female slaves and lash her on the bare skin and justify the deed by the quotation from the Bible, he who knoweth his master's will and doeth it not shall be beaten with many stripes. Our masters do not hesitate to prove from the Bible that slavery is right. And ministers of the gospel tell us that we were born to be slaves. Emancipation, my friends, is the cure for slavery and its evils. It alone will give to the South peace and quietness. It will blot out the insults we are born, will heal the wounds we have endured, will pacify the resentment which would kindle to a blaze, and though it may never unite, the many kindred and dear friends which slavery has torn us under, it will 
be received with gratitude and a forgiving heart. The church and prejudice delivered at the Plymouth Church Anti-Slavery Society, December 23rd, 1841. One in God, make a majority. In my youth, I was a member of the Methodist Church. When I came north, I thought one Sunday I would attend communion at one of the churches of my denomination in the town I was staying. Upon entering, I noticed the white people gathered around the altar while the blacks clustered by the door. After the good minister had served out the bread and wine to one portion of him, them near him, he said, these may withdraw and others come forward. Thus he proceeded till all the white members had been served. Then he drew a long breath and looking towards the door exclaimed, come up, colored friends, come up. For you have known God and God is no respecter of persons. I haven't been there to see the sacraments taken since. At New Bedford, where I live, there was a great revival of religion not long ago, and many were converted and received, as they said, into the kingdom of heaven. But among those who experienced religion at this time was a colored girl baptized in the same water as the rest. So she thought she might sit at the Lord's table and partake of the same sacramental elements with the others. The deacon handed round the cup, and when it came to the black girl, he could not pass her, for there was the minister looking right at him. And as he was a kind of abolitionist, the deacon was rather afraid of giving him offense. So he handed the girl the cup, and she tasted. Now, and it so happened that next to her sat a young lady who had been converted at the same time, baptized in the same water, and put her trust in the same blessed Savior. Yet when the cup contained the precious blood, which had been shed for all, came to her, she rose in disdain and walked out of the church. Such was the religion she had experienced. Thus you see, my friends, this prejudice goes even into the church of God. Freedom is a road seldom traveled by the multitude. Frederick Governors, Dublin, Ireland, 1845. I am now safe in old Ireland, in the beautiful city of Dublin, I can truly say I have spent some of the happiest moments of my life since landing in this country. I can finally exhale. This may be the first time in my life that I do not fear for this life. I seem to have undergone a transformation. I live a new life. Instead of the bright blue sky of America, I am covered with the soft gray fog of the Emerald Isle. I breathe and lo, the chattel becomes a man. Ladies and gentlemen, there is perhaps no argument more frequently resorted to by the slaveholder in support of the slave system than the inferiority of the slave. This is the burden of all their defense of the institution of slavery. The Negro is degraded. He is ignorant. He is inferior. And therefore, tis right to enslave him. A distinguished gentleman tra lately traveled throughout your country. Instead of confessing its sin before God and universe, he spread the pitiful argument for slavery because of the inferiority of our race. 
I was anxious to see slavery overthrown throughout the kingdom, but I never appealed to Irishmen in a manner calculated to awaken feelings of hatred or disgust or to inflame their prejudices toward America application or in a manner provocative of national jealousy or ill will. But I always appeal to their conscience, to the higher and nobler feelings of the people of Ireland to enlist them in the cause. I always appeal to their manhood that preceded their being Irish. What if we are inferior? Is it a valid reason for making slaves of us? For robbing us of our dearest rights? Can there be any reason found in moral or religious philosophy justifying the enslaving of any class of beings? Merely on the ground of their inferiority, intellectual, moral, or religious? If we search the words of inspired wisdom, we shall find that the strong are to bear the infirmities of the weak, teaching the wise the duty of instructing the ignorant. And if we consult the better feelings of humanity, we find all hearts on the side of the weak, the feeble, the distressed, and the outraged. In no sound philosophy can slavery be justified. Tis at war with the best feelings of the human heart. Tis at war with Christianity. In the name of Christianity, I demand that the people of Ireland be interested in the question of slavery. In vain may the slave owner tell you, it is no concern of yours. My friends, it belongs to the Irishmen, not because they are Irish, but because they are men. Slavery is so gigantic that if it cannot be coped with by one nation, hence I ask the intelligence and humanity of the entire people of Ireland to rise and stand against that infamous system, slavery. The North Star, Rochester, January 1849. In order to divert the hounds from the pursuit of the fox, they went hurrying and sometimes drawn across the trail. The hounds mistake it for the real scent. The game is often lost. We look upon the recent debate in the Senate of the United States over this wrinkled old hurry of colonization as a ruse to divert the attention of the people from the foul abomination which is sought to be forced upon the free soil of California and New Mexico, and which is now struggling for existence in Kentucky, Virginia, and the District of Columbia. <laughs> the slaveholders are evidently at a stand to know what trick they shall try next, to turn the scorching rays of anti-slavery light and truth from the bloodshot eyes of the monster of slavery. This discussion of it is most painful and agonizing. And if it continues, the very life of this foul, unnatural, and adulterous beast will be put in imminent peril. So the slaveholding charmers have conjured up their old familiar spirits of colonization, causing the old essence of abomination to flounder about in its grave clothes before the eyes of Northern men to their utter confusion and bewilderment. Friends, what we see is the old colonization spirit revived. We hear the impudent proposition entertained by the Senate of the United States of expelling the free colored people from the United States, their native land, to Liberia, we are of the opinion that the free colored people generally mean to live in America. We do we not, not mean to go, go back, back to Africa. Africa. 
our minds are made up to live here if we can or die here if we must. So every attempt to remove us will be, as it ought to be, labor lost. Here, here we are, are, and here we shall remain. remain. Frederick Douglass, July 4th, 1852. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty and unholy license your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your shouts of liberty, liberty and, and equality, equality are a mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parades and solemnity, are to him <coughs> mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy a thin veil to cover up crimes, which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation of the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Go, go, go. search where you will. Roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world. Search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, compare your facts to the everyday practices of this nation. And, and you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America, America reigns without a rival. Rochester, New York on March 2nd, 1863. Men of color to arms. thing worse than rebellion is the thing that causes rebellion. When the first rebel cannon shattered the walls of Sumter and drove away its starving garrison, I predicted that the war then and there inaugurated would not be fought out entirely by white men. Every month's experience during these dreary years has confirmed that opinion. A war undertaken and brazenly carried on for the perpetual enslavement of colored men calls logically and loudly for colored men to help suppress it. Only a moderate share of sagacity was needed to see that the arm of the slave was the best defense against the arm of the slaveholder. Hence, with every reverse to the national arms, with every exulting shout of victory raised by the slaveholding rebels, I have implored the imperiled nation to unchain against her foes her powerful black hand. Slowly and reluctantly, that appeal is beginning to be heeded. Stop not now to complain that it was not heated sooner. This is not the time to discuss that question. Leave it to the future. When the war is over, the country is saved, peace is established, and the black man's rights are secured as they will be. Action, action, not criticism, is the plain duty of this hour, words are now useful only as they stimulate to blows. The office of speech now is only to point out when, where, and how to strike the best advantage. There is no time to delay. The tide is at its flood that leads on to fortune. From east to west, from north to south, 
the sky is written all over now or never. Liberty won by white men would lose half its luster. Who would be free themselves must strike the blow. Better not be than to live as slaves. This is the sentiment of every colored man amongst us. Yes, there are weak and cowardly men in all movements. We have them amongst us now. They tell you this is the white man's war. And that you'll be no better, you'll be no better off after than before the war. That the getting of you into this army is to sacrifice you on the first opportunity. Leave them to their timidity or to whatever motive may hold them back. I have not their timidity or to whatever motive may hold them back. I will undertake to forward to Boston all persons a judge fit to be mustered into the regiment. You have only to apply to me at any time within the next two weeks. Let us go quickly and fill up the first colored regiments from the north. Men of Unite. Washington, D.C., 1871, the dedication of the Lincoln Monument. Truth compels me to admit, even here in the presence of the monument we have erected to his memory that Abraham Lincoln was not in the fullest sense of the word, either a man or a model, in his interests, in his associations, in his habits of thought, and in his prejudices, he was a white man. He was preeminently the white man's president, entirely de devoted to the welfare of the white men. He was ready and willing at any time during the first years of his administration to deny, postpone, and sacrifice the rights of humanity and the colored people to, to promote the welfare of the white people of this country. In all his education and feeling, he was an American of the Americas. He came into the presidential chair upon one principle alone, namely opposition to the extension of slavery. His arguments in furtherance of this policy had their motive and mainspring in his patriotic devotion to the interests of his own race to protect, defend, and perpetuate slavery in the United States were in existence. Abraham Lincoln was not less ready than any other president to draw the sword of the nation. He was ready to execute all the supposed guarantees of the United States Constitution in the favor of the slave system anywhere inside the slave states. He was willing to pursue, recapture, and send back the fugitive slave to his master and to suppress a slave rising for liberty, though his guilty master were already in arms against the government. The race to which we belong were not the special objects of this consideration. You are the children of Abraham Lincoln. We are, at best, only his stepchildren. Children by adoption children by forces of circumstances, and yes, necessity. It especially belongs to you to sound his praises, to preserve and perpetuate his memory, to multiply his statues, to hang his pictures upon walls. Instead of supplanting you at his altar, we would exhort you to build his, his monument. For though Mr. Lincoln shared the prejudices of his white fellow countrymen against the Negro, it is hardly necessary to say that in his heart of hearts he loathed and hates him. Amen. Amen. The world
Women's Suffrage Conference, 1888. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. Ladies and gentlemen, although I've long been identified with the women's suffrage movement and have often spoken in its favor, I am somewhat at a loss to know what to say on this great and uncommon occasion where so much has been said. When I look around on this assembly and see the many able and eloquent women full of the subject, ready to speak, and who only need the opportunity to impress this audience with their views and thrill us with thoughts that breathe and words that burn. I do not feel like taking up more than a very small space of your time and attention and shouting out. I would not even now presume to speak, but for the circumstances of my early connection with the cause and having been called upon to do so by those voices in this council, which all gladly obey. Men have very little business here as speakers anyhow. And if they come here at all, they should take back benches and wrap themselves in silence. For this is an international council, not of men but of women and women should have all the say in it. I believe no man, however gifted with thought and speech, can give voice to the wrongs and present the demands of women with the skill and effect with the power and authority of woman herself. Woman knows and feels her wrongs as man cannot know and feel them. And she also knows as well as he can know what measures are needed to redress them. I grant all the claims at this point. She is her own best representative. We can neither speak for her nor, nor vote for her nor act for her. And the thing for men to do in the premises is just to get out of her way and give her the fullest opportunity to exercise all the powers inherent in her individual personality and allow her to do it as she herself shall elect to exercise it. So I gladly step aside to let this grand assembly of women advocate their cause. They are essential to the steady growth and onward march of progress, and they must enjoy the triumph of democracy. Let's move forward. 1896. It is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Do not ask me what will be the result of the so-called Negro problem. I cannot tell you. I have sometimes thought that the American people are too great to be small, too just and magnanimous to oppress the weak, too brave to yield up to the right of the strong and too, too grateful for public service ever to forget them or fail to reward them. I have fondly hoped that this estimate of American character will soon cease to be contradicted or put in doubt. But the favor with which this cowardly composition of disenfranchisement has been received by public men, white and black, by Republicans as well as Democrats, has shaken my faith in the nobility of this nation. I hope and trust all will come out right in the end. But the immediate future looks dark and troubled. I cannot shut my eyes to the ugly facts before me 
So strange things have happened of late and are still happening. Some of these chances dim the luster of the American name and chill the hopes once entertained for the cause of American history. He is a wiser man than I am, who can tell how low the moral sentiment of this republic may yet fall when the moral sense of a nation begins to decline and the will of progress to go backward, there is no telling how low the one will fall or where the other will stop. The Supreme Court has surrendered. State sovereignty is restored. It has destroyed the Civil Rights Bill and converted the Republican Party into a party of money rather than a party of power. A party of things rather than a party of humanity and justice. We, we make our lives what one one death. Death. Principles, which we all thought to have been firmly and permanently settled by the late war, have been boldly assaulted and overthrown by the defeated party. Rebel rule is now nearly complete in many states and it is gradually capturing the nation's Congress. The cause lost in the war is the cause we gained in peace. And the cause gained in war is the cause lost in peace. But I come now to another proposition held up this noun as a solution of the race problem. And this I consider equally unworthy with the one just disposed of. The two belong to the same low-bred family of ideas. This proposition to colonize the colored people of America and Africa or somewhere else. Happily, the scheme will be defeated, both by its impolicy and its impracticability. It is all non nonsense to talk about the removal of 8 million American people from their homes in America to Africa. The expense and hardships, to say nothing of the cruelty of such a measure, would make success impossible. The American people are wicked, but they are not fools. They will hardly be disposed to incur the expense, to say nothing of the injustice which this measure demands. Nevertheless, this colonizing scheme, unworthy as it is of American statesmanship and American honor, and though full of mischief by some colored people, seems to have a strong hold on the public mind and at times has shown much might and vigor. The bad thing about it is that it has now begun to be advocated by colored men of acknowledged ability and learning and every little while, some white statesman becomes its advocate. <coughs> Those gentlemen will doubtless have their opinion of me. I certainly have mine of them. My opinion of them is that if they are since they are insecure, and if they are insincere, they are not sensitive. They know or they ought to know that it would take more money than the cost of the late war to transport even one half of the colored people of the United States to Africa. Whether intentionally or not, they are, as I think, simply trifling with an, an afflicted people. They urge them to look for relief, but they ought to know that relief is impossible. The only excuse they can make is that there is no hope for the Negro here, and that the colored people of America owe something to Africa. This last sentimental idea makes colonization very fascinating to dreamers of both colors. But there is really no foundation for it. They tell us that we owe something to our native land, but when the fact is brought to view, we should, should never be forgotten that a man can only have one native land, and that is the land in which he is born.
The bottom falls entirely out of this sentimental argument. Africa, according to her advocates, is by no means modest in her demand of us, upon us. She calls upon us to send her only our best men. She does not want our riffraffs, but our best men. But these are just the men we want at home. It is true we have a few preachers and laymen with missionary turn of minds who, who might be easily spared. Some who would possibly do as much good by going there as by staying here. But this is not the only colonization idea. Its advocates want not only the best, but millions of the best. They want the money to be voted by the United States government to send us there. Now I hold that the American Negro owes no more to the Negroes in Africa than Africans owe to the Negroes in America. There are millions of needy people over there, but there are also millions of needy people over here as well. And the millions here need intelligent men of their numbers to help them. As much as the as intelligent men are needed in Africa. We have a fight on our hands right here. A fight for the whole race. And a blow struck for the Negro in America is a blow struck for the Negro in Africa. For, for until, until the, the Negro, Negro is respected in, in America, America, he need not expect consideration elsewhere. All this na native land talk is nonsense. The native land of the American Negro is America. His bones, his muscles, his sinews are all American. His ancestors for 217 years had lived and labored and died on American soil. And millions of his posterity have inherited Caucasian blood. <clears throat> Where the people of this mixed race to go. Their ancestors are white and black, and it will be difficult to find their native land anywhere outside of the United States. Colonization forces upon the black man the idea that he is forever doomed to be a stranger and sojourner in the land of his birth, yet he has no permanent abiding place here. All, All this, this is purple. Such ideas <clears throat> constantly flaunted before him. He cannot easily set himself to work to better his condition. In such ways, or as are open to him here, it sets him to groping everlastingly after the impossible. Every man who thinks at all must know that home is the fountainhead, the inspiration. The foundation and main support not only of all social virtues, but of all motives to human progress. And that no people can prosper or amount to much without a home. But to have, have a home, the Negro, Negro must have, have a country. country. You are an enemy to the moral progress of the Negro, whether you know it or not. And when you call upon him to break up his home in this country for an uncertain home in Africa, but the agitation of the subject has a darker side still. It has already been given out that we may be forced to go at the point of the bayonet. I cannot say that we shall go gently. And so, in consideration of what to do with the races, I say, Colonization is not the solution. Do you not find it surprising that the colored press of the country and some of the colored orators of this country insist upon calling it a Negro problem? Now, there is nothing the matter with the Negro. He, he is, is all right. Learned or ignorant, he is all right. He is neither a lyncher, a mobocrat, or an anarchist. He is now what he has ever been a loyal, law-abiding, hard-working, and peaceable man. So much so 
that men have thought him cowardly and spiritless. They say that any other people would have found some violent way in which to resent their wrong. There is no reason, therefore, in the world why he should give a name to this problem. And this lie, like all other lies, must eventually come to naught. A lie is worth nothing when it has lost its ability to deceive. If it, it is in my power, power, this lie shall lose its power to deceive. In old times, when it was asked, how can we abolish slavery? The answer was, quit stealing us. The same is the solution of the race problem today. The whole thing can be done by simply no longer violating the amendments of the Constitution of the United States. If this were done, there would be no Negro problem to vex the nation. Let the political parties live up to the noble declarations we find in their platforms. Let the nation try justice and the problem will be solved. Can the Negro be a citizen? Can the Negro be educated? Can the Negro be induced to work for himself without a master? Can the Negro be a soldier? Time and events have answered these and all other like questions. I didn't know I was a slave until I found out I couldn't do the things I wanted. I prayed for 20 years but received no answer until I prayed with my legs. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. You have seen how a man was made a slave. You shall see how a slave was made a man. A gentleman will not insult me, and no man, not a gentleman, can insult me. Where, where justice, justice is denied, denied, where poverty is enforced, where ignorance prevails, and where any one class is made to feel that society is an organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither persons nor property will be safe. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, it never will. The life of a nation is secure only while the nation is honest, truthful and virtuous. Let, Let the statesmen of the country live up to their, their convictions. This is last thing. Have a seat, Jens. Have a seat. Thank you. So we took 18 speeches. The average speech was two and a half to three hours long. And we condensed them into a core reading using the ideological style of the um the selfie so that we could take snapshots from his speeches as though the audience had clicked in in emotion at times. Uh before we enter Introduce our two guests. The first are our colleagues from Philadelphia who are working at Penn State on the color convention movement. And they will contextualize for us, John, where these speeches took place and what was his, what were the situations that changed his arc of identity yeah. and took him from being pro-colonization to anti-colonization. And then our dear friend, Dr. Tanya Keynes Taylor of Westchester University and the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education, Hashi, will speak to us about the Frederick Douglass Society across the 14 Hashi campuses and how they are working to make these words relevant to the coming generations. But first, I ask you gentlemen, you've been introduced to this material in only a week. What did you know about Frederick Douglass before and what part of yourself did you see in his words as we read this afternoon? I'd like to start yeah. off with that. Sure. Um, uh, you know, I'm very cursed what I knew about Frederick Douglass beforehand. 
very, very cursory. You know, you find out that he was, uh, you know, he was an abolitionist and a statesman and a uh, fundraiser. And he also worked with uh, in the suffragette movement to a certain extent at the early part. What I've learned, but I, I did not know so, I learned so much about him, especially in this piece, as we went through his life starting like shortly after his slavery when meeting Thoreau and um, and, uh, and those gentlemen and Nantucket. And then towards the end of his life, we see this very almost kind of jaded individual who saw a lot of his of the strides that were made being take being swept back by re, um, by the Reconstruction. And <laughs> where I saw myself, oh yeah, when he was at the uh, George Washington unveiling of the George Washington Monument. Sorry, not George Washington, but the Lincoln Monument. Lincoln Monument. Talking, saying, "Hey, he was not really all that great." You know, what I mean, Stan said, "Like, I would like to believe that being put in that situation, I would have the same." intestinal fortitude to go ahead and speak a truth to power like you know to be in like this place where everybody's supposed to be hey wasn't Lincoln really great well kind of you know what I mean he was like I said he was like you know he wasn't really a parent to us he was kind of just a step parent you know we have to also remember the the speech that he made at the Lincoln Memorial in 1871 was the year after the 15th amendment had passed and the year that he had seen his friend Octavio Cato shot down in Philadelphia in the street, trying to cast his vote. So it really had changed his opinion uh, of Lincoln. He also was concerned that the promise that Lincoln made for the United States colored troops, which was equal salary and equal uh, benefits, was uh, never completed. And oh yes, that the 40 acres and the mule promise, which was the uh, anchor for economic development and revitalization, uh, was deferred. Unfortunately, the good friends, it was deferred. The Irishmen who had fought in the Civil War had not been paid. And so they were paid off with the land that was promised to black soldiers. So, so that, that's quite a challenge. Uh, Paul Hood, who is a brilliant playwright and actor uh, and uh, uh, logician with language and so, Paul, what did you find about uh, the the language of Douglas from the his first kind of country folk way to his uh, courtroom prosecutor speech? Uh, yeah, I mean, what I noticed was, um, and this was something new to me. I didn't realize he had that. He always, to me, seemed like someone that came out confident from the from the door. So I didn't realize he had that fear of speaking in front of white people. Um, that was kind of surprising to me. And um, I noticed the art in his language. Language got more poetic and a little more um, uh, more impactful as he progressed throughout his uh, life. And I found that to be like um, something that was very, uh, very interesting and inspiring in a way. Well, in, in addition to his discovering uh, in Ireland his freedom, and in addition to the women of Ireland and England purchasing Frederick Douglass's freedom, Frederick Douglass returns home from Ireland with his freedom papers in his pocket and comes down the ramp, ramp of the boat and into an America on the threshold of the Key Participate Act. What kind of mental disorder could that have, have, have caused him? But Paul, in addition to that, he meets Daniel O'Connell, the great uh, Irish liberator. And he discovers the ability Clark to throw his voice. He goes to O'Connell speeches. O'Connell speaks that Frederick up until that time, Aaron spoke in churches, small intimate rooms, congregational rooms, their 1800 seat, 2000 seat halls. He listened to how O'Connell would pick his voice up, Mark, throw it up into the air, make it spin to the balcony, you know, and he could uh, tell him to turn the, the last person in the cheapest seat into a front row person just by that. Well, she discovered that that model, he comes home 
a, a kind of a, a new origin. Uh, Mark, you're a deep thinker, um, and you you touched me a bunch of times as we reviewed this script. What were some of the most meaningful speeches to you? The one that I read where he was calling to arms black men to fight against the slavery, against the movement of slavery. I, I had no idea that that was part of his life. That's what he did. And he did it in such a way that um, was so eloquent. Um, and it, I mean, to be able to, he, he states that there are some that were not a part of, that do not want to be a part of that, or that they're just saying that they're going to be sacrificed. But he still gives a convincing, uh, a convincing speech about this has to be done. This cannot, uh, unless, you know, for, for white men to do this without the help of the black slaves, it would, it really wouldn't have the type, same meaning and the same feeling and the same, um, I can't think of the word. We must be self-realized. We yeah. must be participants instead of supplicants. Yes. You know, That's what makes it We work. must be active Look. in our uh, and and he 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 forces that forces enforces that speech as he comes through the Civil War years and the promises of the Reconstruction Amendment are implode on him and he sees that we have to start all over again. But of course, by the time Mark that he gets there, he's not the only one out there speaking. Du Bois is out there speaking, and Garvey is out there speaking, and Booker T is out there speaking, and there are many, many positions and opinions, and he is no longer being charged only by outsiders, but he's being confronted and charged by people. Yeah, yeah. We have the poet laureate, past poet laureate of Harrisburg, uh, and the Reverend Nate Gadsden with us, and Pastor, you had his early speech where he indicts the church, and you had his last speech where he talks about hypocrisy. Do you want to comment on that before? Well, yeah, I, uh, in personal, have a great affinity for Africa and for uh, the continent of African people of African culture. At the same time, I visited Africa at least, uh, twice. And so at the same time, I grapple with understanding that I'm African American. And not black, not just not Negro. I'm African American, and so I do see America as my home. This is where I was born and raised. That's what I know. Uh, at the same time, I don't separate myself from the people of Africa, and I think that's what he was grappling with. And so when he made that one comment that a blow for the African American is also a blow for the African in terms of our progress and uh, our freedom, freedom of mind, freedom of spirit, uh, I, that resonated with me. And so I think he, and then you mentioned all the other voices that were out there. Uh, that, you know, a little bit contrary to what he was thinking and saying. But at the same time, everyone was on the same accord, but seeing it in different ways. And that's the thing that we all grapple with even today. So when he indicted the church and said, and even, of course, because that's where so much of that showed up in terms of uh, separation. And even when Dr. King said the most segregated hour in America would be 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning, yes, it yes. harkened back to that. And so we've always known the church to have that dual reality, that dual, you know, problem of one, we praise God, and two, we separate ourselves, you know, from each other, or they separate themselves from us, let's put it that way. And then finally, the last point I'll make is that I was a member, let's say, of Capital Presbyterian, and I remember one day we decided to have a meeting with the uh, Mark Square Presbyterian Church. I didn't know that history. I was born and raised in the Church of God in Christ. So when we had this big program, and I thought, oh, okay, this is interesting. But no, what happened was the people of Capital Presbyterian Church, not named that then, left Marcus Square Presbyterian Church because of the way they were treated. And they realized that God was not there for them the way it was there, you know. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, Elder Creek was formed and then Capital was formed. And so just to be in the midst of that rich history and to talk on both sides, both white, black, and to really, you know, delve into what's this all about? And then to really have a conversation about, is this really about God or is this something else? I thought it was so powerful. So that's what it's, it's up with me. It's very powerful, uh, Nate, from the, the position of 
this man who was raised in uh, evangelical tent uh, revivals, and he decides to go to church in the north, and he witnesses this thing on the communion rib that the that the blood of Christ is segregated, and that you can't even be that that, that shock must have been overwhelming. I encourage all of you uh, to read as many of his speeches as possible, but also to uh, read this last speech, which is called Lessons Learned, because he is speaking simultaneously in that speech to Booker T. Washington and talking about trades. He is speaking to W.E.B. Du Bois and the talented Kemp. He's saying, we need to keep our talented Kemp here. Yeah. You know, it, it's not only that they want a talented Kemp, Mark, they want millions of our talent. You know, and that's a very interesting. We need our talent here. But he also makes Aaron this brilliant distinction between what is home. And to, to, to have a home, you have to have a nation. And um, he puts the question that is on the news tonight, what to do with the Negro, yeah. uh, both in its present dilemma and its past. And so I asked the gentleman to join the front row, and I'm going to ask our good friends from the color convention movement if they'll uh, contextualize some of these speeches for us, ask you all some questions, but also fill in what were the events that these speeches came from, what were the uh, circumstances of the changing 1838 to 1850 in the Fugitive Slave Act, 1850 to 1865 and the end of the war, 1865 to 1896 and Plessy versus Ferguson, which is around the time of Frederick's uh, death. I encourage you to use these monologues, gentlemen. It has been a joy to work with you. That's how we took what would have been the 800 hour marathon, Frederick. You know, like <laughs> And moved it down into a coral reef. Come join the audience and we'll. we'll... Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? I don't know, um, Lenwood, if you could give us an indication that you can. Yes, we can. Excellent, excellent. Yes, Thank you can. so much for the invitation to join. It was wonderful listening to the presenters who took us in such a powerful and meaningful way into Douglas's uh, oratorical ex tradition of excellence. Um, so what we're going to do very, very quickly is just give a little, this is Dr. Jim uh, Casey, who is one of my colleagues here at the Center for Black Digital Research. Um, and he's actually the founder of Douglas Day. When you have the time, and we're going to, we're going to encourage you even if you don't do it today, to do some transcribing, which Dr. Jim Casey is going to talk more about. But we're responding to Lenwood's invitation. And so we're going to talk to you just a little, little teeny bit about Douglas and his context. But then we're going to actually screen around 10 minutes of a short video that is actually a recording of one of the speeches that he gave called Why Hold a Colored Convention. And that's actually going to truthfully, in Douglas's own words, give you a lot of information about Douglas the activist, Douglas the man, and his analysis of the role that he played both in the United States as an African-American activist, but also as a humanist, because this was part of his whole perspective and tradition, which did not compromise his belief or practice of his Christianity. So Jim, do you want to talk a little bit about Douglas just to kind of set this speech up? And then we're going to do a share screen um, and give you an opportunity just to see a little bit. And then because it is Chautauqua, hopefully we're going to be able to have a chance to engage in some dialogue. So if that sounds good to you, we can go ahead and get started. So. Sure, uh, we come bearing many gifts. Um, uh, the video that we are about to show you was a production that Denise, along with a number of other folks produced with an actor by the name of Hassan El Amin, uh, who was extraordinary to see in person enough that we thought we have to record this so that we can share with other people. 
And part of that is because he delivers this speech in 1883. He is somewhat of an elderly man by that point, an elderly statesman living in Washington, D.C. And for the 40 years prior, he had been participating in the Colored Conventions Movement, which was a seven decade long movement of black activism in the 19th century, which we don't know nearly enough about, in part because it was so often confused with other movements of the day that tended to be white led, that tended to prioritize more than just the networks of black activists working together. And so Douglas had joined this movement in 1843 and attended, we think maybe more of these state and national political meetings than any other person in the 19th century. He was constantly attending these major conventions, giving speeches, engaging in these kinds of Chautauqua uh, discussions with people as a, you know, a kind of formative experience for his rise to prominence. Mm -hmm. And across this movement, what we see is that he's constantly getting feedback. It's not just the sage on a stage. There were many, many other people who influenced his thought who pushed back at him, who said, sometimes we think about it this way, and we need to develop and expand the way that we're thinking about collective organizing, the way that we're thinking about freedom seeking is more than just mm -hmm. the fight against slavery, but also issues facing communities around education, labor, voting rights, citizenship. And so across four decades, he's engaging in these conversations all across the country. And then we get to the late 1870s and the early 1880s. The movement has begun in many ways to fall apart. The rise of racial violence, especially in the South, had made it difficult compared to even the years before the Civil War for Black communities to hold open political conventions, right? We have many examples of Tennessee, North Carolina, Georgia, Maryland, where open conventions were physically attacked, right? Which meant that oftentimes those conversations found other routes. And that meant in some ways the loss of the momentum of this movement. And so in 1883, Douglas living in Washington, D.C., joins with another group of activists that we could spend a long time talking about in putting out a new call for a national colored convention, not a state level, not just a local neighborhood gathering, but a recognition that each of the issues facing his community in Washington, D.C. and across the country weren't just local problems. And so he puts out a national call and nobody supports it. This is really one of the fascinating moments I'm convinced we need a Netflix series, a mini, an HBO miniseries about this part of his life because he has no support. And the younger generation pushes back and says, we've made inroads into the Republican Party, of course, a different Republican Party back then. And we don't want to have just distinctly Black-led movements. We want to try and work at integrated political organizations. And he said, OK, I understand. I've done that work myself. But I still think there's an important role for a Black convention to take place and have these conversations. And so the speech that we're about to show you is him addressing both concerns about how the younger generation is building on the legacies of his generation, subsequent generations, but also right on the eve of a presidential election, knowing that black voters could have the ability to shape the future course of both the presidency and national politics. And I. I can't imagine why that would be relevant to us today in 2024 by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and so when he gives a speech, he's talking to those multiple audiences. And I think it really goes to show the ways in which Douglas saw his oratory is not just a set of charismatic, powerful, moving sort of speaking abilities, but really as a core part of his intellectual and political work. And so when we listen to the speech, but I would encourage you to notice is the ways that his speeches is, is addressing multiple audiences all at once. He's addressing in some ways what we used to perhaps less positively call the all lives matter audience, right? right? right. Well, he's also trying to talk to the young 20 something black men and women sitting in this large convention hall in Louisville, Kentucky. And so we'll pull up the speech um, in just a moment. There's a longer version that I would really encourage you to watch. It runs about 22 minutes. And even that is an excerpt from a much longer speech um, that I think would take an hour and a half to perform in full. So we encourage you to be able to find that at colorconventions.org where you can find that freely available. Um, but we also have this speech um, that we're gonna pull up in a moment um, to be able to share with you. Do you wanna just go to the, sure. the direct? Yeah. Yeah. We're, gonna find, we're gonna pull out the, the high quality, high resolution for you. 
be able to follow the full the full effect. Um, if you go to my YouTube channel, running faster. Um, and then, as we show the speech, what we're hopefully going to do is be able to engage in conversation and hear how folks are able to receive the speech. But then we also want to do a little bit of time to share the activities that we put on here at Penn State, but also at something like 180 different locations on four continents around the world today, uh, which is a way to mark the chosen birthday of Frederick Douglass with a transcribe it line, which meant that we partnered with the Library of Congress who has digitized many of his letters and then put them online for people to help transcribe. And that means that we're able to change quite literally the historical record for what we can be able to find online to understand not just Douglas's legacy, but the many networks that he was enmeshed in as an elder statesman in Washington, DC. So we're gonna show the video. We'd love to have a little bit of a conversation about it. And then we can show you a very, very quick tour of the kind of activities you can find. It's free, it's open, it's very beginner friendly if you've never done this kind of work. Um, and our work is gonna be continuing in the days, weeks, perhaps months to come until we transcribe this entire archive. May I ask mm -hmm. two things? May I ask two things? The first is if you would be kind enough to those of you who have joined us virtually in our audience with your comments or your questions or your thoughts in the chat room. We may not get to all of them, but we will be able to have uh, the record. And the other is if, if uh, you would do me the courtesy of after you talk about this piece, let's have uh, Tanya join the conversation and then we'll go back to all of them. Their activities across. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We can't hear anything, or I can't. This is Tanya Tims Taylor. We are working on a number of challenges uh, with technology. Okay, sure. We'll, we'll try and reshare it. I think if you click share screen uh -huh. and then that one right there share sound. Sure so. there's always an extra button to click right thank you for telling us All right. really cool. Going back. <laughs> there we go
Fellow citizens charged with the responsibility and doing what we may to advance the interests and promote the general welfare of a people lately enslaved and who, though now free, still suffer many of the disadvantages and evils derived from their former condition, not the least among which is a low and unjust estimate entertained of their abilities and possibilities and their value as citizens of the Republic. Allowing the existence of a magnanimous disposition on your part to listen candidly to an honest appeal for fair play coming from any class of your fellow citizens who may have or may think they have rights to assert or wrongs to address. The members of this national convention chosen from all parts of the United States representing the thoughts, feelings, and purpose of colored men generally would most respectfully and earnestly ask your attention and favorable consideration to the matters contained in the present paper. Born on American soil in common with yourselves, deriving our bodies and our minds from its dust, centuries having passed since our ancestors were torn from the shores of Africa. We, like yourselves, hold ourselves to be in every sense Americans and that we may therefore venture to speak to you in a tone not lower than that which becomes earnest men and American citizens. Having watered your soil with our tears, enriched it with our blood, performed its roughest labor in time of peace, defended it against enemies in time of war, and at all times been loyal and true to its best interest. We deem it no arrogance or presumption to manifest now a common concern with you for its welfare, prosperity, honor, and glory. If the claim thus set up by us be admitted as we think it ought to be, it may be asked what propriety or necessity can there be for the convention of which we are members? And why are we now addressing you, asking for justice and fair play? These questions are not new to us. From the day the call for this convention went forth, this seeming incongruity and contradiction has been brought to our attention from one quarter to another sometimes with argument sometimes without argument sometimes with seeming pity for our ignorance and at other times fierce censure for our depravity these questions have met us with apparent surprise astonishment and impatience we have been asked what more can the colored people of this country want than they have now? And what more is possible for them? It is said that they were once slave, they are now free. They were once subjects, they are now sovereign. They were once outside of all American institution. They are now inside of all and are a recognized part of the whole American people. Why then do they hold colored national conventions and thus insist upon keeping up the color line between themselves and their white fellow countrymen. Happily for us and for the honor of the Republic, the United States Constitution is just, liberal, and friendly. The amendments to this instrument adopted in the trying times of reconstruction of the southern states are a credit to the courage and statesmanship of the leading men of that crisis. These amendments established freedom and abolished all unfair and invidious discrimination against citizens on account of race and color so far as law can do so. In their view, citizens are neither black nor white and all are equal. With this admission and this merit of reproof to trimmers and traitors, we come again to the question, why are we here in this national convention? To this we answer, 
First, because there is power in numbers and in union. Because the many are more than the few. Because the voice of a whole people oppressed by a common injustice is far more likely to command attention and exert influence on the public mind than the voice of single individuals and isolated organizations. Because coming together from all parts of the country, the members of the National Convention have the means of a more comprehensive knowledge of the general situation and may, therefore, fairly be presumed to conceive more clearly and express more fully and wisely the policy it may be necessary for them to pursue in the premises. Because conventions of the people are in themselves harmless. And when made the means of setting forth grievances, whether real or fancied, they are the safety valves of the republic. A wise and safe substitute for violence, dynamite, and all sorts of revolutionary actions against the peace and good order of society. If they are held without sufficient reason, that fact will be made manifest in their proceedings. And the people will only smile at their weakness and pass on to their usual business without troubling themselves about the empty noise they are able to make. But if held with good cause by wise, sober, and earnest man, that fact will be made apparent and the result will be salutary. That good old maxim, which has come down to us from revolutionary times, that error may be safely tolerated while truth is left free to combat it, applies here. A bad law is all the sooner repealed by being executed, and error is sooner dispelled by exposure than by silence. So much we have deemed it fit to say of conventions generally because our resort to this measure has been treated by many as if there was something radically wrong in the very idea of a convention. It has been treated as if some ghastly secret conclave sitting in darkness to devise strife and mischief. The fact is, the only serious feature in the argument against us is the one which respects color. We are asked not only why hold a convention, but with emphasis, why hold a colored convention? Why keep up this odious distinction between citizens of a common country and thus give countenance to the color line? It is argued that if colored men hold conventions based on color, white men may hold white conventions based on color and thus keep open the chasm between one and the other class of citizens and keep alive a prejudice which we profess to deplore. We state the argument against us fairly and forcibly and will answer it candidly and we hope conclusively. By that answer, it will be seen that the force of the objection is after all more in sound than in substance. No reasonable man will ever object to white men holding conventions in their own interest when they are once in our condition and we in theirs. When they are the oppressees and we the oppressors. In point of fact, however, white men are already in convention against us in various ways and at many important points. The practical construction of American life is a convention against us. Human law may know no distinction among men in the respect of rights, but human practice may. Examples are painfully abundant. It is our lot in life to live among people whose laws, traditions, and prejudice have been against us for centuries. And from these, they are not yet free to assume that they are free from these evils simply because they have changed their laws is to assume what is utterly unreasonable and contrary to facts. 
Large bodies move slow. Individuals may be converted on the instant and change their whole course of life. Nations never will. Time and events are required for the conversions of nations. Not even the We really wanted to let it play for the full 22 minutes, but uh, have that time. we know our time is limited. We both watched that speech how many times? I think we have more times than I... And it's always inspiring and oddly eternal. Um, so we wanted to, again, just scream just a short bit. It's freely and openly available on our site. You can just Google why hold the color convention and it'll come right up. But now we want to open the floor if possible and Lenwood, if it would be possible for you to host this section and just have a conversation. What are the parallels? What are the places that feel as if Douglas perhaps could have given that speech today? What do you understand more clearly about the, the issues, the context, and the passion which sustained them? Let, let us do that, but let us have uh, Dr. Tanya Tams Taylor add her voice to this conversation before Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Then we can open Absolutely. to the whole conversation of each one teach one, okay? So we'll add to their conversation about the history of us convening, the work that is being done presently with new generations of young men and women. And they will tie what is the relevance of that speech and your speeches to the news tonight. <laughs> and the absence, I might say, if you have to leave, the absence of these voices, you know, because I want to ask you all before you leave to also conclude with the conversation of who is bringing this message to us today? Where are these voices? So, Dr. Tonya Kane Taylor, good friend of the family. I am so happy to be here with here with you all. Happy, happy, happy Valentine's Day. I want to say that to you. Happy Valentine's Day. And I would be remiss if I didn't sing um, just a little bit because we are in African-American Black History Month. This month was Carter G. Woodson. He chose it because of um, Frederick Douglass's birthday and Lincoln's birthday. And one of the songs that were um, was made for Lincoln's birthday as a form of like a resistance against the struggles in Jacksonville was lift every voice and sing. So lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our resounding uh, lift and sing till earth and heaven ring. Uh, let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has taught us, you know, facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on to victory is won. So why would I put that in that context, right? Because right now, when we sort of look at, you know, facing the rising sun, that was something that Douglas really, it's it really is symbolic of his life. And if we, um, that some rising sun that comes up every day, right, that moves in every day. It means that the legacy that is being planted is continuing to move. So my task was to talk about the Frederick Douglass Institute, which I love. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually sort of share, and I'm going to basically, again, keep this to a few minutes because I know we got some conversation that we want to have. So first of all, I want to do is I want to give a shout to his wife, which is Anna Murray Douglas. Anna Murray Douglas. We would not have a Frederick Douglass if there was no Anna Murray Douglas. All right, this is, shows the relationship between free black people and um, enslaved people. And so I cannot have a conversation in good consciousness because she made it held it down when Frederick Douglass Linwood, you mentioned earlier when he was um, when he went overseas, when he was in Ireland and in the UK for nearly um, two years. It was Anna Murray Douglas who took care of, of um, four children that they had at the house. So shout out to Anna Murray Douglas. All right. And so again, she helps to shape Frederick Douglass in profound ways. So again, um, again, I'm centering her and I'm lifting her name. The next thing that I would like to do is I want to show you something um, 
at the, um, and we've talked about the United States Colored Troops, and I know that we uh, mentioned that. So this is at Frederick Douglass at the um, Westchester University, we have a statue of Douglass. And around that statue, we have benches, right? So the bench, the first bench was the day that we dedicated the Frederick Douglass statue. Wonderful, beautiful piece of work. And, um, and I'll show it to you in a second. And um, that was on October the 1st, 2013. Frederick Douglass did his last public address on lynching at Westchester University. And voila, 10 years later, I tried to recreate the look, right? Okay, as I as we celebrated a, sta a decade of the statue at Frederick Douglass. And what I would like to say is we have two statues in Chester County. Both, one is at Lincoln University and one is at Westchester University. And if you didn't know, I'm gonna tell you both of those statues were um, commissioned by African-American artists, okay? Both of them were um, commissioned by African-American artists. Um, now, again, I promised to send, uh, show you the, the um, the image of, I have it, and you asked about the legacy of Douglas. I want to sort of share this with you here, right? And this is uh, something from my African-American history program. You can see we have a student there in success, and he is like, yay, right? Now, why is this so important? You all look at this image. You asked, what is the impact of Douglas? Okay. First of all, we when we made the statue of Frederick Douglass, we did several things. We basically made him young because we wanted a population to identify with him. And um, also uh, what we did is that we wanted to put him in the center of campus, right? So you got in um in um in American history. Um, and particularly Southern history, we have Confederate memorials, and they're normally in the in the in the way, right, of any type of area that you're going to to conduct business. So the building that you have behind you, that's the president's and the administrative office. That's one of our major buildings on campus. So we centrally located this piece of iconography that students gather. I do want to bring up this particular piece here when I told you that I recreated an image. And I want you to see the nod to, and that's what I forgot to mention, the United States Colored Troops. I'm sitting on that bench because that was a bench that um, I, um, I that's my bench. You, you know, that's the, we had six benches going around. And let me tell you a story about this bench and why it's important. Because what happens is uh, my faith is a Quaker and I didn't want to have my name on the bench. What happens is I, we had this, we created this idea. Let me go back to the Douglas statue right quick. And again, I'm talking about the Institute. And so what happens is um, we created this um, this image, right? Uh, I mean, we, the, we, we went through the process. I work at a state university. So we had to raise this through private funds, right? Because the state couldn't give us any money. It's a, it's a you know, it, this is a, um, um, and so what happens is that, um, so we pr raised private, uh, private funds over 90% um, of the funds were funded by African-Americans. So what we wanted to do was right by the statue, we wanted to have it where students go in and they reflect on their work. And as they reflect on their work, we wanted to them just to think. So that's why we have the benches. So what happens is that, so of course, when people are contributing benches, what they wanted to do was they wanted to put their, they wanted to put their names on it. But for me, I wanted to have it where it was a, a cause of Douglas. So when students go in and they see this piece, I wanted them to see the United States color, color troops and I wanted them to Google. And guess what? It happens. What happens is the students do not know about the United States color troops. I wanted to him to have an issue on Frederick Douglass, right? That students can go and interact with. And so therefore, right, as Ab uh, as Lincoln, as uh, Douglas said in the Man's to Arms, which we heard read when he said, so your children will not be told be have a stigma or a shame. And so that was the reason behind um, they, you know, that that particular reason why I put my bench is the only one that is not just my name. I mean, everybody else's have their names on it. For me, I was really trying to honor Frederick Douglass and also honor my faith tradition, right? But at the same time, we had to have some uniformity. So they made me put my name on it. Wow. All right. So, yes. 
Can and I'm going to tell us about the Frederick Douglass. Yes, Institute. that's what I'm about to go into right and, now. And okay, we I'm about to go into that now. connection of its relevance to and relationship with the color convention movement. How okay. you're, you're sustaining and maintaining a so, democracy. Yeah. Okay. So what happens is I also wanted to share again this particular um, screen here. Just one second. When Douglas himself um, makes this call, and this is where the color convention is so important, is that um, they have, and I have it. I brought it up somewhere here. So just one second. Um, what happens is the color convention. Um, I mean, excuse me. The uh, Frederick Douglass made a note. In one of my favorite essays um, by Douglas, um, he talks about this is right before he dies. Frederick Douglas talks about um, this particular piece here. So let me see if my computer will bring this up. But again, this is about context. And that's why I was giving you a context to what I was bringing up about why it's important and what we do at the Institute. Okay, and so I right hear Frederick Douglass said in his own words, right, as you all been reading words by Douglass, he says, when a black man's language, and this is from a speech that he gave, um, this is a, um, a speech, if you ever just want to Google it or whatever, it's, it's actually one of my favorites by Douglass, the lesson of the hour, this was done on January the 9th, um, 1894, and um, Douglass speaks of, and he says, and this is why it's important where we put that statue in the like sort um, and how this relates to the uh, color convention. He says that when a black man's language is quoted, let me zoom it in for you. When a black man's language in co is quoted in order to belittle and degrade him, his ideas are put in the most grotesque and unreadable English. While the utterances of Negro scholars and authors are ignored, a hundred white men will attend a concert of white Negro minstrels with faces blackened with burnt cork to one who will attend a lecture by the intelligent Negro. And so it's that piece there, why we put the statue where we did, right? We also, you can see what Douglas is actually um, doing. It's this level of dignity, right? About understanding not only the pieces of iconography, iconography, because remember Frederick Douglass is the most photographed American in the 19th century, but then also the importance of the words that we use and what they convey. And so that's how it relates to the color convention. And again, how and why he wrote so much, right? Because remember at first it was said that, it, that they thought that he was basically a puppet that somebody else was writing for him. And so he basically made sure to solidify um, his his relationship um, to, you know, documents. Now, the, I want to go here because I want to share this piece and then we can then take it up for question and answers. So one of the pieces that we have at the uh, PASHI system, the Pennsylvania State Educate, um, System of Higher Education, is the Frederick Douglass Institute. As I've said to you before, the reason that we have the Frederick Douglass Institute, and that's why I wanted to relate it back to Westchester. Westchester uh, went through, the people went through a library, the autograph library. They found something from his second wife that said he gave his last public address at Westchester University, which was on lynching. That's why I like that lynching of the hour. And so um, I'm going to pause here to say Frederick Douglass was born into slavery and he died fighting lynching. That should remind us Linwood, since you asked the question, why the color convention is so important, because what the color convention actually shows you is that freedom is a constant struggle. When they have to rebuild and come back down, it's not something that Frederick Douglass all his life struggled right, for justice. And so what happens is, why it's also important about that comment about the um, the scholarship is because what you see here is that with the Frederick Douglass Institute for the state system, we don't have him in programming only. What we have him is we have um, a, fellow, a fellows program where we actually bring in professors, but then we also have student scholars in which they do the Frederick Douglass debate and remember, at many of these conventions, it really was this exchange. A lot of these conventions are also lyceums. So, you know, you get this exchange of ideas, okay? And when you go to the Frederick Douglass Institute, right, um, this is what we have here at Westchester University. Uh, so on the state system, let me say, on the state system, at all of our colleges, we have a Frederick Douglass Institute because of that document that was found at Westchester University. 
right? So we go into the flagship of Frederick Douglass, and this is the campus that I'm associated with. And what we have is that we have various programs, let it be a scholars program, an awards center, a literacy program, and uh, we just had a banned book program. And as you can see here, we got the Douglas Debates. It's going to happen on April the 9th, and also some creative, you know, arts programs. Again, going into what what Douglas what Douglas means, and so I hope that that um, I look forward to answering any questions that we have. But I hope I um, answered your question about the connection, um, why we focus on scholarship, and I just want to say something. I am from Mississippi. Now let's just say you remember that bench I showed you. I would not be here if Frederick Douglass did not give his last public address. A girl from Mississippi does not think about Pennsylvania. My dissertation was on lynching. Frederick Douglass giving that speech at Westchester University on February 1895 led to that, that program, the Frederick Douglass Scholar. I, I mean, the Frederick Douglass Scholars Program. I am the first Frederick Douglass Scholar in the state system to get tenure and promotion in the system. So Frederick Douglass building his legacy you ask, what's the legacy? I'm walking in it now. And now I got recognized as uh, one of the 50 influential women in the history of that university. And I am in the legacy of Douglas. So Douglas doing his bid business helps me to stand on mine. And that opens us up. Bravo. Bravo. That opens us up to dialogue, both in the chat room and in the room, about the relevance of the work of the Institute the rel relevance of the color convention movement, and most importantly, the relevance of the speeches that the Reader's Theater and that the, the scribe presented to the conversations that face us in this really important year where democracy is on, on the stake. So we'll take some questions from the chat room first, if you don't mind. Uh, we do, I don't see any questions in the chat. It says in. Oh, okay. Those are comments, not questions. Comments in the room. Uh, reality questions you would like to ask our speakers. I have to do the commercial. The color convention book is a, a must on your uh, humanist or scholars table. It came out last year. Last year. Uh, our own Thomas Morris Chester uh, was one of the secretaries of the color convention movement in uh, Pittsburgh and also again in uh, Philadelphia. And the long list of incredible men and women who were speakers, presenters, and antagonists, as in Frederick Douglass, agitate, agitate, agitate. So, questions, comments, thoughts? And I'll also ask our colleagues from the Color Convention to tell us about some of their programs coming up and some of the things that we can participate before we see each other again. Absolutely. Well, Barry, actually, absolutely. I mean, me, but Barry, me. I do want to, can I acknowledge Barry's comment? Because he is a, a person. Barry said, and we thank you, Barry. He said, thank you all presenters for an engaging, enlightening conversation. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Frederick Douglass birthday and Lydia Hamilton Smith. And so we recognize and we thank you for writing that comment, Barry. Thank you. Denise? Absolutely. Thank you for that really, really warm and beautiful a presentation, Dr. Taylor. I really, really enjoyed that. And thanks again, Linwood, for the invitation. I am going to hand this part over to Jim because he has some very, very exciting news just before, in terms of what we've managed to get accomplished with our transcription project today. Um, so you guys are getting this hot off the press, like literally he just pulled it up on his phone, Linwood. And so you're going to learn just how much work has been accomplished by people who are as invested as everyone in these rooms that we're sitting in, in not just preserving Black history, but bringing the themes, the topics, the people forward into this contemporary moment. And so as you guys know, we had our Douglas Day, um, our yearly eighth, this is the eighth annual um, Douglas Day celebration just before we rushed over here to join you guys. Um, we graciously made space for us. And now I'm going to let you know what happened by inviting Jim to speak. And then we're gonna round it out a little bit and see if there can be just a little bit more conversation about that. So Jim, you wanna 
tell everybody what happened sure. and uh, and I I apologize usually I would uh, banish the phone when we're in a conversation like this but there are high school and elementary school classes actively working on the east or excuse me on the west coast right now uh, and they had all kinds of questions figuring out which way they were going to go with some of the work so apologies for uh, spinning multiple plates at the moment. Um, we have partnered with the Library of Congress starting this year and continuing into the future to transcribe, as Denise, I think, said earlier, the letters of Frederick Douglass, both by Douglass to him and by people in his life. And there are somewhere about 18, 18 excuse me, 8,700 yeah, pages right. of that correspondence. It's an incredible diversity of material that can be somewhat difficult to access, in part because much of it is handwritten material. We know that younger folks sometimes have not been given the chance to develop those literacies as well. So we're trying to expand access. We wanna make it easier for folks to engage in that. And so what we did is we set up a program today where folks could sign on just from their couch. You know, you can wear your PJs and sit on the couch, um, but many schools, many groups, many companies have organized community building events. It's Douglas's chosen birthday, so we've gotta have a birthday cake. Some of our colleagues are sitting in the next room having cake right now. Uh, but also then to be able to engage with the materials together, not just as an end, in, un, excuse me, ends into the means, but really as an opportunity to think with Douglas and his contemporaries about what they can offer to us right now. Mm -hmm. So that's the overarching part of it. If I can ask Denise in a moment to pull up the website that the Library of Congress maintains. Um, it is one that we are particularly eager to work with year in and year out because it's very, very accessible we have everyone from, I think fourth and fifth grade was the youngest class we had this year, all the way up through. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Fifth grade, yeah. we're talking about democracy with big. Can you pull it up? Yep. Yep. Actually, what? <laughs> sorry, we're, we're uh, a little bit drive it together here. If you go to DouglasDay.org. Experiment technology uh, problems, those of you who are our virtual audience, uh, the gremlin hunts me. Oh. Denise is gonna pull up, we'll do a, a kind of quick uh, walking tour, if you will, uh, with you in a moment. Um, so Denise, are we sharing the screen right now? We cannot yet, but we can do that right um, now. If we might so be permitted, we can walk you through just a quick way to get to, um, the materials that we can talk about. So what Denise is pulling up right now is our website, which we maintain for this event, douglasday.org, which you can also find by Googling, but douglasday.org is the address. You can watch, we did a three hour live stream broadcast from 12 to 3 p.m. today. That's still on YouTube on our channel. You're welcome to watch that for a much more extensive account, including with the curator, Adrian Cannon at the Library of Congress showing us Douglas's letters with Ida B. Wells Barnett, really kind of amazing, rich materials. But you'll also find this very large link here that says transcribe the Douglas letters. Yes, please. And that's going to take you over to the Library of Congress website. And if you scroll down the page a little bit, you'll see there's all kinds of explanatory text. And I think the part that I might show you, along with all of this material down below, is that you can find fairly easily, if you scroll down to, um, these pages here, these are the actual digitized materials that you can read and help to transcribe. And as you can see from these numbers on the page there, there's been about 7,500 pages already done just since noon today. Um, so a lot of people have been working really, really hard. And let me say just very quickly, when people help to transcribe and then review and approve these materials, these go right into the Library of, Collect Library of Congress's website, but also their permanent collections, right? This, when we talk about changing history, we can talk about it in the larger sense. This is it in a very tangible, concrete sense. What we transcribe goes directly into changing the historical record. So let me explain how that can work. And I'm gonna do it very, very quickly just for reasons of time, you know, it's getting late. Um, if you go to our site, we have web pages dedicated to extensive resources yeah. for doing it on your own, for organizing it into a a community event, or if you have relationships with classrooms, as many of us do, if you're a teacher or otherwise, we have lots of amazing curriculum that Denise and some of her colleagues have developed as well. I can't say enough about how rich that material is. Um, so if, especially as we get to the end of these materials, maybe scroll up. 
to the part at the very top and click on not started. And if you scroll down, these are gonna be all the pages where people have not yet begun to transcribe. We had the awful problem today of too many people trying to crowd around these documents together. Um, maybe just if you wanna choose one. Uh, and so as you find your way through here, you can see, um, let me scroll down all the way. Let's find one with a little bit of white space left. Uh, how about that one right there? At the beginning of this day, all of this was blank. So we're we're catching up in real time, if you'll forgive us. Um, and then, yeah, any of these that say transcribe on them should be ready to go. And so once you've navigated that, that's honestly the, the most difficult part for many of us. Um, you can zoom in and you can find it. And we know sometimes historical handwriting has a little bit of a learning curve. And that's true for those of us who've been doing this for a very long time. We know that's true for almost everyone. And so what we suggest when you do this is you can see the full extent of the instructions on the right-hand side of the page in that text box, which they say, go ahead, start typing, you got this. And there's lots of more detail and references that you need um, as well, but really they want it just to be able to take what you see on the left, and type it on the right. It's really hopefully that simple. And you just start at the top and work your way down. And what we really want to emphasize is that this is a collaborative effort. This is a community effort. And so every piece counts. If you have two minutes and then you have to run off to catch the bus or go to work or pick somebody up, um, that makes a difference. If you have an hour after dinner and you really want to immerse yourself, that's even more fun. That also makes a huge difference. And so we won't get into the live transcription right now, but that's effectively how it works. Um, what I will say just as a last part, and then we can open it up um, for any questions you might have, is that on the Library of Congress site, there's two ways to participate. There's doing this transcription, but then if Denise goes back up to clicks review, it's a two-part process. We do a first transcription and then another person will come in and they will help to double check that that work is accurate because we wanna get this right out of due respect to both Douglas and the importance of these materials. And so That's if you great. click on any of these, what you're gonna find is that somebody else already went in and did the work, which you see on the right here. And so if we were of a mind to take on the reviewing part, which is really an important part of the process, right? It's easy just to jot some things down, but we wanna get it right. Um, and that takes time, and we know that um, we all want to get it right out of full respect for Douglas. Um, and so what we can do is compare the left and the right, and then as we go through and do that, um, we'll be able to log in, and then normally just below the text box on the right, we'll see a button that says, I approve this transcription, or I think it needs more time, and you can go through and actually make changes. To the document there. So, Jim, I have the un uh, unpleasant uh, task of uh, drawing us to a close uh, when there's so much more that we could have a conversation. I'd like to thank uh, Frank Keeley and the Narcisse Theater Company for providing the dynamic readers. I'd like to thank the Frederick Douglass Institute and the Color Convention for drawing. And we had no cake, but we had lots of presents. Uh, um, Please put your email address in the chat so we can be sure to send you the link for this. And we will also include uh, Representative Justin Fleming's closing remarks, which are built upon Frederick Douglass's agitate, 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 and an invitation to remind us to turn our kitchen tables and our dining room tables into voter registration desks in the months to come. So. A lot packed into two hours. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank all of you who uh, who came to us via virtual. You know, I always say that I, I've been in theater since age five, and I always look, peek through the curtains to make sure that somebody showed up in the audience. So I don't take you for granted, uh, both virtual and live. And of course, we thank the um, McCormick Riverfront Library, Thomas Morris Chester Collection. The collection has 172 new works on uh, 
those events surrounding Chester's life, his community, his politics, his sense of education. We have created eight dynamic cards that contextualize the collection around certain things, civil war and civil rights, United States colored troops, early education, women and the vote. You can get those online at Dolphin County Library system.org, dclf.org. And please go on the color convention and, the, and the Frederick Douglass. We will see you again in April in our next uh, session where we are going to take up the work of Maude Holman in uh, 1919 and 1920 as the 19th Amendment and the right for women to vote was passed, but the movement for Black women and the vote began. So uh, these conversations are important to us in this year of animating democracy, and we will hope you stay with us and we thank the library. And of course, well, always. We have an session there, even if I had a bunch of comments and questions that I was about to do that. We'll make sure you have access to their emails, and that we'll also make sure that all those, both present and virtual, receive this link and, and um, Representative uh, Fleming's very important uh, invitation for you to turn your Sunday dinner into a voting registration conversation. So until then, I thank you, God be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Thank Valentine's you. Day. Happy Thank Douglas you. Day. Thank and you. happy Black History Month. Oh, you're out there. Thank you, Barry. I know you're out there. Thank you, Kaz. Okay. <laughs> I know you're out there.